What's up, what's up, Akon Podcast? Welcome to, to another episode with, um, we have a special guest in the house today, Sam. Hey! What's up, Sam? You know what, just chilling in these corona times, just hanging out here. Yeah. Right. How are you guys? Doing good. Marion, how are you? I'm great, Sam. Nice to meet you too. I'm great fist on and thank you so much for coming. We're super excited to have this conversation with you. Yes, that's for sure. Sam, uh, before we get started, tell us a little bit about yourself. And then we could dive into it from there. Yeah, definitely. Well, as you guys know that by now, my name is Sam. Um, 24, living in the Boston area, and I went to UNH with AK here. Um, so we go back a couple years, graduated with a biomedical science degree, and now I'm currently working in nice. medical sales. So it's a little bit of background about me. And so I know you went to UNH, and what school did you go to? I went to, I did undergraduate at Bridgewater State. Cool. And then I'm doing my master's right now in Northeastern. Ooh, nice. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm almost done. A few more weeks. Yes. <laughs> School, man. <laughs> wow. So you were in the science field. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. What was that like? I know we're supposed to be talking about something different, but that's super interesting to me. Yeah, um, it was definitely challenging because while I was at UNH, I was also a Patriots cheerleader. I won a national mm -hmm. title for a pageant my freshman year. I also was heavily involved with a bunch of organizations like Project Sunshine. I was an executive board member at UNH for that, Students for St. Jude's, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. I raised $10,000 for them, so I was very busy. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time in the library also trying to balance a social life, too, and everything else that I was doing. So it was hard, but I figured it out because I graduated, right? So <laughs> here. Yeah, you made it. What? Right? You, you survived. You survived. Well, congratulations. That's Thank good. you. Yeah, now That's that really you've alluded to the Patriots cheerleading, talk about Patriots as a team, um, as a cheerleader in general. In your experience. Yes. Yeah, definitely. So um, I actually never cheered in high school or college. I was a dancer. Um, so the Patriots mm -hmm. cheerleading squad is more accomplished dancers. So I literally tried out on a whim. I never really thought that I could be a Patriots cheerleader. I applied. I tried out. The audition process was about six weeks. Um, and I made the team my first try, which was really exciting. So I did it throughout my junior year of college, um, cheered all the games. We only do the home games. And then I went to the Super Bowl as well. We didn't get a Super Bowl win, but I mean, I went to Minneapolis for the first time. I got to meet a bunch of people and make a lot of connections. And it was a lot of fun for me. Um, I turned in my pom-poms to focus on the medical field because then I was graduating and I wanted to get a career. So that's why I stopped cheering, but I loved every second of it. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much that in a high level overview. Right, no, that's pretty good. I want you to actually go in details a little bit and talk about the process from going to uh, a dancer in high school to a cheerleader in college and to the Patriots because I feel like there's a lot of young girls who are looking up to you mm -hmm. who want to probably follow that path and they need to know how it goes. Yeah, definitely. So um, in terms of the Patriots cheerleading squad, there are two squads. There's a promo squad, which is more of girls that do promotional appearances for the Patriots. So you could be anywhere from Bank of America to a stop and shop. As, but then we are looking for more of leaders in the community. So if you have a heavy background in volunteering like myself, um, you'd be a perfect fit. And then the other team is the dancers. We're all considered one team, but everyone has a different role. Um, in terms of dancing, it is very competitive to try out. Um, the tryout process is a very long and extensive process, but if you prepare yourself very well, you can definitely get on the team. So it's interviews, um, final auditions, where you walk down a runway, you show your personality, you answer a few questions. Then from there, you go on a boot camp. Boot camp is a series of workouts, um, so media training, all that fun jazz, and then she selects the team. So as you go through interview, final auditions, and boot camp, the number of girls starts getting cut from there. So mm -hmm. when I tried out, it was 500 girls that auditioned. Wow. And then as you keep going to each round, they narrow it down. And then the number for the team is 34 girls. So half the team is girls that are returning. They call them veterans. And then the other half would be necessarily rookies. And they mix and match from there. So my advice to someone that would make the squad is definitely reach out to anyone on the team. Ask some advice because we all want to help. I remember talking to numerous girls, helping them out, trying to get on the team. And just honestly be yourself um, because throughout, throughout the interview process, she's looking for someone that's very genuine, likes to help out in the community because the Patriots cheerleaders are one of the very unique squads that like to consider the girls cheerleaders in the community. Mm -hmm. So you do a lot okay. of volunteering. You, I built a house with um, Jonathan Kraft in Brighton when I was a cheerleader. I helped... Um, 
I threw I like grained rice when I was at the Super Bowl. I did a lot of things that were volunteering. So that's all I can really say. It's not so much glitz and glam, really, than what you see on the field. That's only probably ten percent of the job. The other ninety percent of the job is really giving back to the community. That's amazing. Like, okay, so you were dancing in high school, mm -hmm. and then how did you hear about? the opportunity to even translate that into cheerleading for the Patriots. Like, what was that process like? And then how did you come to decide, you know what, maybe I want to try out and I want to do that? Definitely. So I saw a friend of mine that I met through pageantry. She had made the squad. And so once I saw her year, I was like, oh, this looks cool. I want to try it out. So literally on a whim, I just applied. I tried out. Um, and every time I progressed a little further, I was a little shocked. I was like, well, I have no idea what I'm doing. Because <laughs> you realize that girls continue to try out for this um, spot on the team over and over and over again. And like my first time I got in the squad, I had no idea what was going on. I felt wow. like I was like, wow, I made it to the next level. Like, okay, great. So, um, I mean, it's a very challenging process. I remember spending about eight weeks preparing for it. Wow. Um, and these some girls spend years preparing for it, their whole lives preparing for it too. So it's a very interesting process, but I think with the right personality and the right determination, the right drive for it, you can make the squad. It's really when your time comes, your time is here, you know. Mm -hmm. Everybody got their own little timing. Right. Um, Trust the process. That, yeah, exactly. That's amazing. That's no, amazing. that's that's pretty cool. So like what were some of the challenging moments as you progressed to become a cheerleader for the Patriots? In terms of In terms of like dancing or as you said, being a leader in the community, mm -hmm. what things had had you had to put out there? to show that you're really the person for this job. Definitely, so I had to talk about a lot of personal experiences when I was trying out for the squad to make sure that I was the right fit and what they were looking for. So talking about your personal life, it's never easy, yeah. um, and especially when you're in the public spotlight too. So when, whenever you're in the media, you're talking, um, it's definitely challenging, especially being a woman of color. You mm -hmm. definitely need to make sure that you're on your toes, um, you know exactly, what it is that you want to portray yourself as and then go from there in your personal life and as well as cheering. Wow, that's that's pretty cool. Thanks for answering that. And the next thing I would like to talk about is were, being a Patriots cheerleader, did you encounter any um, racial injustice? Definitely I did. Um, a perfect example would be when I was in Minneapolis for the Super Bowl. There was a member of the VIP club and the Patriots that made a racial comment. Um, at the time on the squad, there were three black girls, including myself and the team. The rest of them were all white. Okay. So, yeah, so right there it is a little bit of a, not so much an equal number, but that's okay. Um, so there was a comment made and we couldn't figure out who exactly made the comment and how to approach the situation. So we were told to stop working for the day. Mm -hmm. um, so we no longer, we took the uniforms off and we just kind of went with the flow, did our yeah. own thing. but. Nothing was followed up on, nothing was spoken about. We couldn't figure out who said anything. So, I mean, it was tough, um, but at the same time, racial injustice happens every day. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where it's a mindset and how can you learn to educate the rest of the people around you to make change in the community? Because someone like that with a prestigious organization like the Patriots, that shouldn't be happening. Right. Especially when you live in a city like Boston, where we have UMass Boston, which is the number three most diverse school in the country. That shouldn't be happening. I think people should be a little more educated. So in a situation like that, it's how can we learn and how can we move forward, even though it's a tough situation to be at the time. Wow. That makes sense. Like, And, and then when you say you guys have to stop working, was it just the people of color on the team, or did they have everybody stop working? Nope, just the people of color on the team. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. like it was. It turned into more of a safety concern because we weren't really too sure what the who the person was, what the agenda of that person may be. Um, so of course these things get a little messy, and when you don't really have the details, you don't really know what's going on. The organization thought it was best that the people of color just stopped working, wow. and so we respected it at the time. Um, looking back, I wish I made a little more noise about the matter, um, but I mean, with time and with age, you learn about these things and you grow from them, so I just use it as a thing to move forward. So when you say looking back, you wish you had made a little bit more noise. Yes. Like, what sort of noise would you have made? What would what would be different about that experience? I wish that I spent more, I wish I thought about it more and spent more time to find who it was that did that. So not only to bash the person, I don't think, I don't think that, I think that the person needed to be educated. And you think that the person needed to learn from what they were saying, they probably didn't know what they were saying was offensive. 
And I think that by just kind of letting that person go and never finding out who that he he was, gives me the opportunity to do it again to another girl in the squad or somebody in the community, and that's not right. Um, especially with these times and the Black Lives Matter movement, I think that everyone needs to take the opportunity to take a step back and learn about their actions and how can we make change so this no longer continues in the future. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I have to, I have to ask this because I'm listening to you and I kind of feel weirded out a little bit that they just selected the people of color on the team. Whatever, I get the safety concerns, but um, I just want to know how did it make you feel? How do you even feel right now looking back? Do you think that that was the right decision to just select the people of color? But yes, it was a racial comment. Um, but at the same time, it's a team effort, right? Mm -hmm. So if one of your teammates is down or doesn't feel safe, then everybody should be in that bucket. And personally looking at it, I'm like, okay, well, maybe the whole team shouldn't have worked so that this person can learn their lesson or something. And I don't yes. really know the metrics and mm -hmm. the ins and outs, but I just felt like it was, it was interesting that they just selected people of color. Because you know what? That person could be racist, but they can also be um against people other pe religions right they can mm -hmm. be um just they can have a ton of other phobias right yeah. maybe there was a jews there and they may have made a comment around that so i'm just interested to see how does a team a team gets really just how do people get singled out in a team just based on their race because of a comment made yeah definitely at the time i was angry i was upset <laughs> about the entire thing but in terms of the metrics of the team we had to work and do our jobs. So to eliminate the entire team, there would have been no one working the party because we were there to work the party. So, I mean, I get why they did that. I'm not necessarily saying it's right because even now thinking about it, looking back, this happened like two years ago, looking back, I don't even know what the right move was to do because to have no cheerleaders on the floor working doesn't make sense because we had to do our jobs. But at the same time too, if someone's making racial comments, do we continue working and have this person bash us? Do we tell, like, it was just a, it was a mess okay. of a situation. Mm -hmm. So to single out the people of color and have them not work, I honestly couldn't answer that and tell you what was the right move or what wasn't because at the end of the day, somebody had to work. So when you say work these bodies, what does that really look like? Like So your fan engagement, you're taking pictures, uh, you're yeah. signing autographs, you're talking to people, um, you're part of the experience that Got these it. people are paying for. It. So it's like if you remove us, then the fans aren't really getting what they wanted to come to the experience for because that's what's advertised. So if you remove the cheerleaders, they're not getting what they pay for either just because of what one person did wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what can we do to make the situation? And at the time, they were like, you know what? We're not gonna have these girls work. And like, we were upset about it, mm -hmm. but what else, I don't know what else we could have done even looking back on it. Were you guys still paid though for the day? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, money's the move, girl, I feel you. Yeah, you can't, you I mean, can't do that. Move, girl. <laughs> right? Like, yeah, don't have much money. Gotta make that money. <laughs> then I would have really made a lot of noise if the money was involved too, you know what I'm saying? That was a good question. <laughs> you all know you were thinking ahead. it too. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, like, wait, I, I don't know if I called this earlier, but what was the comment? Or do you remember? I think someone said the N word with the hard ER. Ooh. Mm hmm. You hate to see that. And I'm not even being sarcastic. You actually hate to see that. Um, it was very offensive. It wasn't made directly to me, but it was made to another girl of color on the team. Right. Um, and she had dreadlocks too, so you were addressing her hair. It was just a mess. Um, and so we, she was very upset about it. She told us, and then we were just uncomfortable at that point. Because if you oh, have a yeah. problem with her, you have a problem with all people of yeah. color at that Pretty point. Much. And then by that point, we couldn't even find the person. It was just a mess. We never figured out who he was. Um, we tried to bring it higher up, but we just could never figure out who the person was. So we had to let it go. This says a lot about yeah. um, a team like the Patriots being high class first organization, right? That yeah. everyone thinks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, sorry that you had to actually go through yeah. that experience. Yeah, and I mean, I, like for the organization, HR got involved, they tried, but it's just kind of like, when you don't know who the person is, you can't discipline them because you don't know who they are, you don't know the name, you can't figure it out. So it's just kind of like, what can we do to prevent this from happening? And it's like, okay. hands are tied. And this stuff happens every day. Like it's happened to me at work, it's happened to me with my relationships and my friends, it's happened to me shopping. Like these things happen every day and that's why this movement is happening because it needs to stop. Right, so. right. And, and speaking of that, you said shopping. I think you shared an experience with me um, where you had some sort of racial injustice. 
um, exa um, example happened to you. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with the stores, Anthropology, Urban Outfitters, Zara, mm -hmm. all those cool little cute stores. You know, so recently it comes out that they are racially profiling people in their stores by calling them a certain name that is for females, Nikki, and for males, Nick. And I've noticed myself when I've gone into these stores that I have been followed, but I don't, I didn't think of it like that until this all blew up. And so I'm like, really? Dang, this sucks because their clothes are mad cute. But at the same time, I don't feel comfortable shopping there knowing that that is... Put your money where your mouth is, that's so I don't feel comfortable shopping there knowing that that is their policy and that is their protocol and that multiple employees from all over the entire world are speaking on this saying that that is exactly what their protocol was and they thought it was just for their store not knowing that it's a nationwide protocol mm -hmm. that is extremely wrong um and i actually it's hard it's hard talking about it as a person of color too to somebody that just quite doesn't understand mm -hmm. like recently i had a conversation with someone that I consider a close friend of mine and that person just didn't get it, why it was wrong that they were doing it because they considered the clothes to be cute. Um, That's a privilege, right? To focus on the clothes and not the injustice. Not the like, injustice. Oh, yeah, the clothes are cute. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, but racism isn't. Racism, like, it ain't cute. <laughs> it ain't cute. No, that, no. That, I, I don't like it. No, <laughs> no. I think I think it hurts even more for the person to be someone who's closer to you, yeah. right? Yeah, it definitely hurts. A lot and when you the thing the thing about this whole situation too it's like I when people say the words I'm uncomfortable I don't want to talk about this it makes me upset and they're from the other side of the fence meaning that they're not a minority in the United States of America you can't say that you just cannot say that because you don't know how it genuinely feels to live that life every day it's not just a movement it's something that we've experienced every single day yes. and now we're trying to come together as one and be equal that's the whole point of the movement we're not trying to say black people are superior we just want to be seen as equals and clearly from these companies creating these policies we are not seen as equals and it's now being shown to light and people still don't want to have these conversations but we're not going to see change unless we have these conversations so people need to be more open that minded and excuse the way I'm going to put this, but a little less ignorant mm -hmm. um, and be open to having these conversations to create the change together. Because without our white allies, we will never see this change. No. Yeah. So the people that are saying, I don't want to talk about it because it's political. It's not political. It is a matter between life and death. I don't want to talk about it because it makes me uncomfortable. Well, get un get uncomfortable, girl, because it's uncomfortable walking in a store being followed, followed because of the color right? of your skin. Well, you're probably going to buy something. So um, I think that people need to be open to the conversations and to learn from whatever they've done in the past and just grow with the movement and grow with us. And we all can become equal as one and ed educate ourselves and just throw all that in the past and move on. Yeah. Wow, that, that, that's I've, powerful. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Why do you think I'll say, and you probably don't know this answer, but I'm assuming the friend, uh, the, your friend was white and you guys had a long friendship. Actually, mm -hmm. you mentioned that when we were talking earlier backstage. But why do you think that people, white people specifically, feel uncomfortable to have these conversations? Why do you think that that's even an excuse being used? Mm -hmm. I mean, I honestly, I wish I could answer the question for you. I don't. My guess is that like they just feel it's gonna bring the mood down. They don't want to talk about it. The same way people are like never talk about religion and politics, because everyone has their own opinion. <laughs> and I get that, because yes, everybody has different religions. People can be part of different political parties, whatever. But this isn't political, and it's not opinionated. Little boys are being lynched from trees. Like this isn't yeah. this is a matter of life and death at this point. And like we've seen it with George Floyd, how he tragically died in broad daylight. We've seen this for years now, and now that people are sick and tired of being worried about their loved ones leaving, it shouldn't be political, so you shouldn't feel uncomfortable talking about it. Mm -hmm. You should want to make that change for the racial injustice that's occurring in our country. And it's not just black people, it's Spanish people, there are Asian people experiencing this too. So Muslims, for Muslims like it's not an easy conversation, but you need to be open-minded and talk about how we can all grow together and change. No one's going to bash you. Mm -hmm. If you need to be educated on something, like, I'm happy to educate you. I'm not going to bash you. But if you don't want the education, you don't want to move forward, then you can't You can't be helped it's at true. that point. That's true. Uh, so, like, if I were to ask you right now to talk to some of your girls and give them an advice on how to really um, come to the table and have a conversation about racial injustice, what would you tell them? Yeah, I tell them it's all a mindset. Because um, personally, growing up, I had a very hard time. My parents immigrated from Africa. I used to wear single braids. I got mocked in the hallway and called Jungle Girl. 
I people would play with my hair and like just make fun of me all the time. So it was tough for me, but it was all a mindset. Um, so stay positive because these racial injustices they happen every day, mm -hmm. and figure out how you can learn and educate others around you and just grow from it. Um, because at that point, when someone necessarily doesn't understand, at that point it's on them. So be the best that you can, persevere through it, and just create goals for yourself, and just keep chasing the dream, keep the drive up, and keep going, because that's what got me through. So that's the best advice I can, because at the end of the day, there are some people that just can't be helped, and you can't change someone's opinion about right. you. Right. Not everyone's gonna be happy with what you do, so it's what can you do inside of you to make sure that these things that are going on in our country, especially at the moment, mm -hmm. doesn't mentally mess with you. Uh, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think we should bother at all to have these conversations? Like, do you think we should bother to try to help? Um, let's say in your case, our friends, our white friends that who don't understand get it at all, or do you feel like, okay, if you're saying you're uncomfortable, you clearly don't wanna get it, and that's the end of all? I think it's um, by situation basis, mm -hmm. um, case by case, because there are some people that generally are uncomfortable and they think that I'm going to be upset by having the conversation. And if you know me, I'm very easygoing. I don't, it takes a lot to make me mad. So I'd rather have a conversation than you say, I don't want to talk about it at all. So there are some people that just literally don't get it and are not open to it at that point. That's on you. Um, but there are some people that are scared to speak up because they don't know. Like I had a couple of friends when this whole thing started texting me like, what is it that should I be doing? What is it that I'm doing wrong? All these things. And I'm happy to educate and like tell you what is it that you should be looking at. But some people literally just can't be helped. So I think just use your best judgment case by case. And whenever they're ready to turn around and figure it out themselves, be there for them. But if not, there's don't waste your time. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. It's, it's a tough time to be alive. It's, tough. it's a very it's interesting tough. time to be alive too, right? For sure. Yeah. For sure. I, w I would say this um, as well that you're such a fun person, easygoing, yeah. like you said already. <laughs> uh, it's easy to talk to you. So I think um, the positivity that you have all the time, people should actually want to talk to someone like you about it because not everyone in our community is also like you who's willing to actually have, have this conversation. conversation. If they're talking people. to me, I might just bite their head off. <laughs> yeah, for real though. There are some people that are upset, but I'm open. Yeah. I'm open. Exactly. But yeah. you don't want to have that conversation, especially with me, then that's on you. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and one thing I, I have to say though on, on that topic is also you and I go into UNH, right? Like, you know, most of our friends are predominantly white. And like, we, we, we are kind of like in the position where like, we need to continue to educate these people, exactly. right? The ones who, who don't understand or who mm -hmm. wouldn't want to understand. And I think we're trying to do that the best we can. Um, but on the other side, they have to be open-minded. Exactly. Yeah. And you can't force somebody to have that open mind. So at that point, think of yourself and be selfish and just say, you know what? It's already a tough time for black people. It's always been a tough time for black people, but especially now it's tough. Mm -hmm. Don't mentally exhaust yourself trying to change someone's mind that isn't yeah. open to be changed. Self-care through the process. Self-care through the process. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I agree. I yeah. agree. I yeah. think, I think, man, I don't know. I don't I'm. I think I'm personally getting to the space where I have very little patience for white people who don't get it. Because I feel like, especially as an immigrant, and it's 2020 mm -hmm. with the internet. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sorry, sis. If I can learn and understand rate, the complexity of race in this country, if I can learn about racism, if I can understand all of the various system, systemic racism and the way in which the system is discriminating against people, if I can understand and take the time and learn this, what's your excuse? That's exactly like, what I'm saying What's too. your excuse? Like, mm -hmm. just get out of your bubble and find out why people are mad instead of just trying to figure out why you're not mad or trying to justify why you're not mad. Right? Exactly. Like, to me, but but I understand where you come from. And I think it depends on the person. Maybe, maybe I'll be nicer. Who knows? <laughs> right now, I'm person. just like at a... Yeah, no, I don't it's want to talk to you. Like, because nowadays you got Google. It just takes a simple Google search Yo. on your iPhone, on your Android, whatever you've got. Because now 2020 is the year when nine year olds got cell phones. So yeah. I know it's easily accessible. So the people, what I was that's circling back to what I was trying to say, the people that genuinely don't want to listen, they genuinely don't want to listen. Do mm. not waste your time. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So, so you know, uh, I think this conversation we could go on forever. I know. For real. So <laughs> let's 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 get back a little bit to the cheerleading part yeah. of things. So one thing I want to know is, you know, you you were the only black girl, or like how many black girls three, were on that? Three, including myself. On that that team, mm -hmm. that twenty. Out of what was it? Twenty sixteen. Third to four. I was on the squad the twenty seventeen to twenty eighteen season. Okay, so it's three black girls. How hard is it for? black girls to be 
um, cheerleaders in, in, you know, in teams like these? Hard. Um, there are some points where I felt like I was only selected because I was black and they wanted to equal mm. out the um, whites and the blacks. Mm -hmm. There were some points where I felt that. There were some points where I felt I was only selected to do some promotional appearances because of the color of my skin. Mm -hmm. And there were some points where I felt like I wasn't selected because I wasn't blonde. Um, mm -hmm. So it was tough for me. It was a mental roller coaster because I would be available to do all these promotional appearances. Right. I literally was so excited mm -hmm. and then there were some points where I'm thinking like I wonder why she got it and I didn't get it mm -hmm. and and it's it's hard because in the back of your mind especially as a woman of color you always that's always in the yes. back of your mind like who's gonna judge you based who's on gonna my judge skin? you based on the color of your skin and like even circling back to UNH when I got into UNH mm -hmm. my high school was like Sam Ashman only got in because she was black and UNH is a white school so that's why she got in so really yeah these things happen and as a woman of color you really think in your head like do they actually want me or are they using me because of the color of my skin? Even sometimes with modeling, I see that um, some people make comments about my hair, they call me exotic looking, and so I'm thinking, do they want me to make it look like they're diverse or do they genuinely like me as a person and do they like my look and want to give me the job? You'll never know the answer, so it's tough putting yourself in that situation that's always in the back of your mind. Right. Well, so you model as well. I think you just mentioned that. Tell us a little bit about that industry i think a lot of the beauty industry has been changing a ton the more we've yeah. been reclaiming our identities we've been putting pressure on them the more we've been forcing ourselves to be authentic the more the industry has just been shaken and has changed overall so tell us a little bit about that process and that journey for you and also to me i absolutely admire the fact that I'm sitting in having a conversation with a black woman who's in a beauty industry, but also got the brains, right? Like, I mean, we're talking <laughs> science, science, medical field. Like, that's something, because a lot of times people think it's either you're pretty and dumb or you're smart and in the medical field and kind of being able to merge those two things. Like, what's that process like for you? Definitely. Um, I got started in modeling rather young. I got discovered in a mall. Um, mm -hmm. An agent approached my mom, told her that I should start modeling. We were hesitant. Um, we had a conversation with the agent on the phone, and I was awarded a scholarship to go to modeling school. So oh, I did. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I did modeling school um, twice a month on the weekends in Newton. Um, my I was twelve at the time, so I don't even know what grade are you when you're twelve. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's not I get into that. I, don't even, I have no idea. None of us are gonna win. I exactly. know you should be sixteen in. No, you shouldn't be sixteen in ninth no grade. Clue. No, I don't even know. But right, anyways, whatever. moving on from that. But it was tough because um, the modeling industry, it's like you're pretty much picked out, picked out for the way you look. And throughout the years, mm. it's been evolved. When I first started, they told me that I literally need to lose like 15 pounds because I was like that. And I was like, I'm sorry, it, it ain't happening. So I continued to eat my pizza because I was like, honestly, at this point, it ain't happening. So, all day. Yep, I got very heavily involved in pageantry, um, all, all of that jazz. But it's interesting because literally I'm, when you're modeling, you're selected because of the way you look. Um, so that question, it's like, do they want me or do they want a black girl? Mm -hmm. Do And then on top of that, too, it's like your hair is different. And it's like, do they want me because they think I'm exotic looking or do they do they want like, you know what I mean? Like, what's the racial undertone in their in the preferences and their choices? Right. And, and nowadays, for example, Sports Illustrated, they're one of my favorite brands. I mean, because you see people of all colors, all sizes, all backgrounds, like, for example, Halima, she is literally a black Muslim yeah. Woman, yeah. Like, yeah, what woman and she's modeling in Sports Illustrated. That yeah. is such a big change from what was happening even three years ago. Like you see mm -hmm. curvy girls, you see ethnic girls, you see Spanish girls. So <laughs> I think that the entire industry needs to change in the way that Sports Illustrated is trying to mold their brand um, to make people like myself feel more comfortable. Cause I get emails for jobs and I'm like, okay, that's dope, but like, do they want me because of mm -hmm. me and like what I have to offer or because they're just looking to create the diversity? You'll never know. Yeah. So, That's true. You'll never but, know. But so, have you worked for Sports um, Illustrated at all? So I actually submitted myself to the Sports Illustrated swimsuit contest. I went to Miami, competed in that, didn't make it, but it opened a lot of opportunities for me. That's so amazing. So I did. Um, I've been on. I don't know if you've seen it in Target. I guess now it's blowing up. But yeah. um, I've been on baby box covers. I've been like fake moms. Um, I've modeled for Puma. I've modeled for. What else? Um, 
I recently just did something with Sephora. So like I've been building. Sephora has also been trying a lot to be diverse in many ways. Yeah, yeah um, Ella Stein Jewelry. So I've been incorporating my like over the last couple of years, it's been picking up for me. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's just kind of like, do they want me because? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> my skin color because nowadays it's really a hot topic yeah. or do they want me because of like what I have to offer and I don't even know people really realize that like how much black people internalize racism like how much it makes us second guess ourselves how much doubt it creates within ourselves right absolutely and um, I think and, and I hope that by hearing you talk and share your story people can really understand a little bit of what that process is like internally. Like, like I'm good at this. I know I'm pretty enough. I know I deserve it. But what are your motives? Like, why are mm -hmm. you selecting me? Like, do you really, really want me? Or am I just another quota to you? Um, Definitely. And, and I hope people really get that from, from hearing you talk yeah. and sharing your story. Even That's modeling a aside, it's like I've been out in New York, Miami, LA, and I've gone out to like even bars clubs where i walk and i'm like are they gonna like me because i'm black mm -hmm. and i've experienced like the racism in like clubs in new york i've experienced it and it's just kind of like it's always a question that's in the back of your mind and i think that people fail to realize that um so that's like the big disconnect like i don't think people realize that like at the end of the day no matter how much you try that's literally going to be in the back of your mind because of the way the country was built right I, I have to say that I really believe that you have a strong mental state. Yeah. And I want you to kind of like give your perspective about what it takes, what kind of mental state it takes to be in these settings that you've been in. <laughs> and how can a young black girl look up to you and take from you what you've been able to do? Definitely. I would say it's just all mindset. I've always been very, I'm the type of girl that's go, go, go. I don't like to sit down. And if I have nothing to do, it actually stresses me out. Mm -hmm. So what helped me was creating not big goals, but mini goals. I would say by the end of the month, I want to accomplish this. By the end oh, of this, God. I want to accomplish this. So small baby steps to get to where you really want to be. And then you'll <clears> look <throat> back and be like, oh my goodness, a year ago, I was here and now I'm here. I think that a lot of people, they jump the gun too quickly and they like to make these big ideas. Like, I want to be a millionaire, but how are you going to get there? Mm. So, that's... Right, it's just coming for me now. Like, like yeah. don't, 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 don't take shots at me, sis. <laughs> uh, -uh. You know? But it's like, how are you going to get there, you know? That's and true. it's like, that's true. what are you passionate about? And what can you offer? And who can you connect with? Who can you talk to? Because nowadays, it's just like, it's all about your connection to you know and your brand. Yes. So how are you branding yourself? What do you want to be known for? So make those like mini goals for yourself and then little do you know, you'll be where you need to be in like within a year or two. So mm -hmm. that's what helped me in high school and in middle school, especially with um, growing up in a town like Lemonster, Massachusetts, very white, really yep. white. I live in Worcester. Yep, yeah, I know. <laughs> very white. So yeah, that's all I really have to say about that. But how do you go like, to piggyback, um, picking back off his question, because I, I really think that you have to have a strong mental, um, you have to have thick skin in this industry, mm -hmm. period, yeah, right? To totally. be able to go through these things. And then I'm assuming, I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, that obviously your experience being bullied as an immigrant here played 100%. a role in that. But tell us a little bit more about how do you get to the point where you just are able to thrive in this industry no matter how they look at you, no matter how they view you. Honestly, you just gotta stop caring. You yeah. gotta you gotta stop caring about what other people think about you because at the end of the day, yes, you have your friends, yes, you have your family, but at the end of the day, it's you standing there. Mm -hmm. So what are you gonna do to make your life better? Because I know for me, my parents immigrated to the United States because they wanted to create opportunity. So I knew that it was my responsibility to create the best life for myself because I could have been in Ghana right now selling stuff in the street with you know, yeah. so like yeah. they could have chose not to come here and giving me this opportunity. So I made it my duty to make the best life out of myself and give my my parents wanted to make sure that me and my brother had better. And that's what I'm trying to do. So I'm hopefully doing the right thing that they wanted. <laughs> but that was like that was my motivating factor to help me get through. Um, so in terms of like other people like myself that have parents that have immigrated from wherever all over the world, mm -hmm. um, think of that. Like you could be in a third world country and in a less fortunate situation. Mm -hmm. So we're in America where they do call it land of the free. Sometimes you question that, but it's the land of the free. <laughs> and uh, opportunities, no, enough opportunities, opportunities, yeah, opportunities yeah. are here. So what can you do with yourself to make sure that you get to where you need to be? That's amazing. I agree. That's amazing. Yeah, no, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, I think we're almost close to wrapping this up. But Sam, before we are finish, 
Huh? Are we though? Because I want to know where do you oh, see go yourself ahead. Go ahead. in like five to ten years. Definitely. When do you, you want to be in five to ten years? Um, I mean, I have a ton of side hustles going on right now. Lots She's of about to be a millionaire. You and I need to stay in contact. <laughs> I'm not sure Beyonce's friends are living the life. I'm yet. dead. <laughs> Sometimes you just need that one friend to make it and then you're good. I'm dead. <laughs> make sure y'all let me know. I got you. I got no, you. No, no mail allowed. I got Sorry. you. Um, but I actually see myself owning a business and uh -huh. running from there um, within the medical field. So I see myself doing that and also starting off a nonprofit. So I've been thinking about a nonprofit for the last two years. I'm actually, with the quarantine, it gave me a lot of extra time. So I've actually started the works with that. So I see myself managing that, owning a business, and quitting the nine to five life because people say they love it, but I don't. No, there's nothing good about it. That's not where the money's being no, made anyway. No, you want to make the money yourself. Yeah, I 100% agree. To go off of that, um, someone who is originally, whose background is Ghana, Africa, do you plan to go back and do mm. stuff there one day? Oh, 100%. So even as we speak, my parents are actually planning on relocating back yeah. to Ghana. And like, once my brother graduates high school, I'm not high school, college, he's... See, you forget how old they turn. But um, <laughs> college, and I definitely want to go back to Ghana and like do the best that I can. I have cousins there that have started like hostels, gyms in Ghana, and I want to nice. definitely get in on the business and figure out like how to make something different in Ghana because mm -hmm. it is one of those third world countries, you know. Yes. And so you want to bring it up. It's up and coming. It's rising. People are just starting to figure out that Ghana is actually pretty lit, yeah. and that you definitely want to yeah. go. <laughs> but I want Ghana to be like one of those countries where like it's Italy and people are like, oh, I want to go there. So right. how what can I do to make sure that you get gone on the map? Haven't figured it out yet, but I'll def I'm definitely thinking about it. And what what are you thinking your nonprofit would be about? Yeah, educational mission? inequality. Um, yes. So I've noticed that when you live in a more wealthy area, you have better opportunity. <laughs> And you come. You need from to a, come back for systemic racism. Yes. <laughs> yes. You have um, better opportunities, but when you come from a city like Lemister, it's blue collar. Worcester, mm -hmm. it's blue collar. You don't have the same opportunities. Like I remember, I was trying to apply to Boston College or Eastern Arizona, and my guidance counselor told me you'd be really good at Mount Washington Community College. You should yeah. try that. And I'm like, wow, you really hate to see this. That's so then crazy. I get into all the schools that I applied to, and it was a shock. And I think that it's because of where I grew up and the pretty much the color of my skin, my background, 100%. my background. 100%. And I think that kids need to, they're, they're more than enough and they need to be able to believe that. And so once you put that in someone's mind that they go to community college, it's just kind of like you think that's all you are. And that's not the case. So Yo, Can you imagine that they told Michelle Obama that she wouldn't get accepted into Princeton? For oh, real. I didn't know that. Like her guidance yeah. counselor told, told her, her, what are you doing with your life? You're striving I mean, too high. You know, look at her. Yeah. Like, yeah. seriously. Like, and, and can you imagine how many young people of color out there hearing this day in and day out all the time and how that's impacting them? Because exactly. you and Michelle and everybody else that just hears this and is like, you know, whatever, I'll prove you wrong and just excel are the really minorities or the people that are trying to push and thrive and people that have that support system. Exactly. But there are others who are hella smart and hearing this and then giving up. Exactly. For sure. So like, my, that's crazy. My mm -hmm. idea for a nonprofit would be to put these kids that want better but they don't really know exactly what they want, mm. take them to places in the community. Like you never know if somebody wants to be a biologist until they visit like a biology place. Or you don't know if somebody yes. wants to do architecture until they see a bridge. Mm. But in schools these days, you literally are opening a book and you're preaching to kids about what happened like 500 years ago. They don't teach you how to do your taxes. They don't teach you how to do any of the necessary things you need to know to survive. So how can we change that in our school system to give everybody the same opportunity? Because right now you see wealthy areas like Newton, these kids going to these prestigious schools. Yeah. What about everybody else? What about those inner city kids? Mm -hmm. Like, That's where we're missing here because the kids are our future. And if you're not giving one, everyone the same opportunity, we're never going to see change. And that's what I want to bring to the table. This is amazing. It. You're touching on systematic racism, but we definitely have to leave that for another topic. Because we could go for on and <laughs> on and just not finish hours, that one. Hours. Oh, man, Tim, it's such a joy and a pleasure to be with you and talk to you and exchange with you on these matters. This, I think, was a, was a phenomenal conversation for sure. For sure. And I think, I think it's... it's, it's <laughs> it's been great, honestly. Because <laughs> it's just like we just left them speechless. <laughs> literally, like you, you got me shook over here and stuff. But um, I think this is good. Like a lot of good advice. But I still want to end it on this note. Please give some advice to the youngers out there who are looking to become a model or a cheerleader, and how to get there. Yeah. 
create goals for yourself go for it and don't ever get unmotivated find something every day to motivate you whether it's a motivational app a book a friend you talk to even praying every day whatever you got to do keep the vision keep the faith and trust the process thank you black girls rock yes <laughs> and also black lives matter Yes. All day. All day, baby. That, that's Sam, all. thank you for coming on the show. Uh, we appreciate you. Obviously, let's stay in contact. Um, uh, we, again, ha we have to stay in contact because when the, <laughs> the millions start coming in, we want to be close by to share with I you. I got you. <laughs> that's a fact. Well, I hope I get there, but we yeah. got you. You, you, you will. You You're will. Um, make sure you subscribe. Um, this is Sam. We'll make sure that you, you, know, you, see, you see this episode and like, learn as much as you possibly can. Um, Sam, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me, guys. This is fun. <laughs>